Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Bernard Kippelen. I serve as Vice Provost for International Initiatives at Georgia Tech. And uh, on behalf of uh, Georgia Tech and its leadership, I would like to uh, welcome you to that event that is part of the 13th edition of uh, France Atlanta. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with France At Atlanta, it's a, it's a partnership between uh, Georgia Tech and uh, the French consulate here. Uh, in Atlanta. Uh, it was created in 2010, so uh, we're very, very uh, happy and uh, excited uh, to uh, have been part of a, a long legacy of uh, a very close and vibrant collaboration uh, with, the, with the French consulate, but uh, France Atlanta is, goes really beyond just Atlanta. It's also a celebration of uh, collaboration in the areas of innovation, science, uh, culture and uh, humanitarian activities in the entire southeast of the of the United States, and so I would like to uh, thank uh, Benoit Montreuil and, and and his team and, and and the center for organizing that event on the physical internet uh, uh, workshop, and also uh, acknowledge uh, all the participants who actually made the trip uh, from France to participate to today's event. So uh, welcome again, and uh, I would just. Uh, hand it over to uh, Rami uh, Abiyako, uh, who's the attache for science and technology at the Consulate to France to also uh, add a few, few words of welcome. Rami? Uh, thank you, Professor Kipelen. It's my pleasure to be here today uh, in this 13th edition of France Atlanta. Uh, we are very proud of the partnership that we have with uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, as you know, Georgia Tech has the campus in Lorraine, France. It's the first American campus on American soil. And through this campus, uh, we were able to build a great partnership between uh, France, the consulate here, and Georgia Tech. That continues through this uh, uh, annual series of events. We're even more happy because this year, we're returning to in-person events for all the uh, events planned for France Atlanta 2022. And this is the first science event that it's back in person. Um, maybe I just add that, uh, as Brianna said, we have cultural, humanitarian, business, and science events during France Atlanta. We like to celebrate friendship and partnership between the Southeast, more generally, and France. And we really rely on Georgia Tech because this is where we find the best partners uh, in the Southeast, and we'd like to continue it. So uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the, the speakers today, um, especially those who made the travel. From, from France, um, and thank uh, Bernard for the uh, continued uh, collaboration, and I wish you a very fruitful uh, seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rami, and uh, without any further ado, I would like to hand it over to uh, Tim Brown, who's the Managing Director of the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute. So, have a wonderful and productive workshop. Thank you. Thank you all very much and welcome. Uh, the theme of today's at France Atlanta event deals with the physical internet, of course, and particularly on shaping the evolution of supply chain and logistics ecosystems for enhanced resilience and sustainability, which has come to the forefront, particularly over the past couple of years. Um, to give you a, a brief outline of uh, today's events, we're going to uh, do some introductions of our Blitz presentation speakers. And each speaker will speak for eight minutes. Um, you'll see me stand up at the end of eight minutes and get ready to shove them if they, they uh, exceed by too much. But then after um, eight minutes, we're going to open up to questions. First, uh, we're going to look for dialogue amongst the panelists. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And we have two microphones on either aisle, if you'd like to ask a question. And I'll ho help uh, moderate and pick out uh, questions there. If you are asking a question, please be succinct in um, asking your question. You don't have to provide uh, a summary of your uh, dissertation or anything along those lines. So you can, can get to the point so we can keep uh, moving along. Many of you are familiar with the physical internet concept. However, if you're not, um, to give you a, a sense for it, um, I'll give you a basic idea of it, and you'll see it rounded out 
through today's events, um, through the, the Blitz presentations. And then by the way, around noon, we'll have lunch here in this building in the adjacent room. And then after lunch, back we'll uh, convene for those who are interested back at uh, the, the Industrial and Systems Engineering Complex on the other side of campus where as you came in, you were probably uh, uh, greeted with uh, uh, options to go to presentations in the Physical Internet Center or the Siren Lab. So those will take place this afternoon. If you, if you weren't caught on that, um, uh, perhaps on a break, you could uh, reach out to the folks up in the lobby on that. So Blitz presentations, Q&A, lunch, and then um, project-specific initiatives to help round out an understanding of, of where we are in physical internet adoption. And it's very appropriate that physical internet's a theme for the France Atlanta initiative as it's, uh, uh, physical internet is, is growing and has its roots in uh, participants from, from uh, both countries. So physical internet, basically it takes the um, the, the concepts that associated with the digital internet, where if we're showing a presentation or sharing a presentation, uh, making a telephone call, sending an email from one part of the world to another, once we hit send, it all becomes bits and bytes, and it flows through standard protocols, uh, and through equipment, um, through wireless networks, it's, uh, it's uh, somehow magically uh, appears on the, the, the other side and is re-established re, um, uh, re in a usable form. But we don't care. We don't know what specific routing, routers it's going, going through. Um, it's, it's going through a shared network using standard protocols um, and the data is encapsulated. So what we want to do with the physical internet is take those concepts and apply them to the physical world. We think of the how in 1970, uh, sea containers transformed global trade, which used to be very, very labor intense and lots of issues with security and damage and that type of thing. Sea containers enabled multimodal transport that's much more efficient and has opened up the world to, to a, a whole transformation. So if we do the same thing, but to an, another level, making standardized containers down to the smallest level, from cartons to boxes, uh, containers, you know, speaking in pie language, you know, pie shipping containers and pie cartons, that type of thing, and have them be rigid, reusable, um, sustainable, connected to the internet, then we have comfort in um, our packages not being lost, we know where they're at. And with that comfort, just as we use an Uber today to move ourselves across the country or, or across the city, um, we feel comfortable letting anyone move our um, containers. And it opens it up through standardization to more efficient transport, more efficient loading, more efficient sharing of resources, um, uh, more efficient material handling equipment, more efficient use of material handling equipment uh, and warehousing, and uh, even manufacturing processes. So that's where we're headed, and you'll hear the term hyperconnected an awful lot um, in presentations this morning and then this afternoon. And so that's that's a, a key theme: hyperconnectivity, you know, the, the overall sharing of the supply chain and logistics ecosystem. So with that as a, a backdrop. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce the speakers in order of uh, their presentations. Uh, first, we have Eric Ballou. Eric is a professor in supply chain management at Mines Paris uh, and deputy director of the Scientific Management Lab. He's worked with Benoit Montreux on the physical internet concept since its inception and leads the initiative in Europe where the Alliance for Logistics Innovation and Cooperation Europe, ALICE, um, is very active. Um, and so he's an active researcher in physical internet. Welcome, Eric. Matthew Laura is a full professor and deputy head of the Industrial Engineering Center at IMT Mines Albi. Uh, he is the Pierre Fabre Agile Supply Chain Chair and the scientific director of various public pri and private joint research labs and research projects. He's also an adjunct professor here at Georgia Tech where he works closely with us um, on a number of PI related initiatives and also an adjunct at the School of Economics and Management at Beijing Jiaotong University in, in China. Um, Louis Fajot unfortunately was not able to, to join us. Um, it's kind of sad, we were looking forward to seeing uh, Louis but he uh, had a, a last minute um, uh, 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 
in, in uh, something that stopped him. Um, next, uh, Frederick uh, Benaben. Frederick is professor at the Industrial Engineering Center of IMT Mines Albi. Um, and uh, since 2019, he's been the head of the Safety and Crisis Management Research Team, um, which includes a number of researchers, professors, engineers, um, postdocs, etc. cetera. Um, and that's uh, associated, okay, got that. And um, uh, he's also uh, very engaged in the efforts in the Siren Lab Initiative uh, between Georgia Tech and um, uh, IMT Mines Albi. And his research focuses on data management through model-driven engineering for decision support, um, including artificial intelligence frameworks that combine data sciences and industrial engineering. Uh, Johan Levy is a mathematician, consultant, and educator in the era of AI and big data. He's focused on uh, making a difference in the world through algorithms and mathematical methods uh, to make better manage, uh, management decisions. Uh, let's see. Um, he's been teaching at Kedge uh, Business School in Bordeaux and at the University of Bordeaux. Uh, welcome. And finally, uh, Professor Benoit Montrol, world-renowned scientist who has introduced uh, collabor who has introduced in collaboration with students and colleagues an imposing set of paradigm challenging leading edge contributions through four decades of research leading to um, the emergence of the physical internet concept and taking it from concept to reality. Uh, Benoit is the Coca-Cola Chair for Material Handling Systems here at Georgia Tech, um, the Director of the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute and um, Director of uh, uh, other centers since as the uh, Siren Lab, which we'll hear about further today. So with, uh, Without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Eric Ballou to come up and uh, share some thoughts with us, and then we'll follow with questions and dialogue. Good morning. So I'm Eric Ballou, Professor at Min Paris. It's my pleasure to be with you uh, at George Zeck. It all started here with uh, the guidance of Leon McGuinness more than 10 years ago. Benoit, I, and a couple of others were in the same room, but a much, much, much more smaller group than, than today. So it's good to see the thing growing. And uh, I want to share with you um, what we are doing. So when we are talking about the physical internet, it's, we start with something physical, right? Uh, the packets that we are dealing with are boxes. So this box looks like all of the boxes in supply chain. The main exception is, the main difference is that this box um, was designed to be standardized and shared between all the partners of the supply chains in the care sector in Germany. So already there are more than 10, 20 partners involved uh, in that ecosystem uh, to make it work from the manufacturers to uh, the retailers. And what we see is that that kind of box going from one side to the other of the supply chain and flowing back, of course, uh, will uh, save a lot of money uh, for uh, something like up to 30% for some product families. So the idea is to, of course, we started with the easiest one, where the savings were the higher. And the idea is to expand, because the more we have, the lower the cost. But it's not only about physical things. It's also about uh, knowing what we can share. Wh what is the network? In our case, the network is a network of services, logistics services. If you talk about transportation, there is no freight transportation. There is no real map, real-time maps of transportations. With Orange, which is a French telecom company, we are able now, with full respect of RGPD and telecom uh, regulations, to track and trace all freight vehicles. Here you have an example around Paris. So what you see here is not map matching on the highway, but the result of the computation of the position of trucks uh, in, in the day. So what's the point and what's the relation with the uh, physical internet? If we want to share resources, we should know where they are, where, what is available. So we should have the big picture so we could do the routing in a better way. So it's uh, some kind of a step to start with. Of course, to have that, and in the previous uh, example, we work only with mobile, dat mobile data, no other devices, but for many applications, we will need more devices to build new services. 
So we built with uh, Orange again um, some kind of uh, framework to go from sensors from many sources, many players, uh, many sectors, uh, to build something from the physical system to a digital twin to a semantic level and then to build services on top. The, the big idea is that even if you don't know that there is someone with a sensor, a resource, a technology that could provide you a service, you will be able to connect, you will be able to eventually use that service, pay for it, of course, and, uh, and check that it was done in the right way. And for the first time, it was fully integrated from the bottom to the top. And here in Paris, so the picture is like another picture, but you have here, if you want to deliver something, you have the map real time of park uh, delivery prices, but also from uh, other trucks, competitors, hubs, so you can integrate of all things all together. Right now, not everything is integrated in real time, but you can imagine that in the near future, it will be the case. The main ob objective here, the main objective is to limit the amount of resources that we're going to use. And city for that is a good place because there is a lack of space and uh, sometimes also a lack of time uh, to do the, the job. So we want to do that uh, services and check what is the potential what kind of new services and what kind of benefit we can bring to uh, the cities and the people to the cities by removing trucks uh, on the road. But if you think about a system that could uh, help you to work with the others, like competitors, like it is the case in the digital internet, most players, they work also with competitors because you are not in the best position everywhere. At some point, it will reshape how service, services are designed. It will reshape the network by itself. In Europe, we have a couple of projects and we are working on one, but there is another one here as an illustration, which is Cargo Souterrain. The idea of Cargo Souterrain is a shared infrastructure with different services underground to avoid all kinds of traffic jam in Switzerland by putting the freight underground. Because, and it's quite, uh, <laughs> Surprising, but in cities, and cities like Paris, but also Atlanta, most of the people travel on the ground. This is more true for Paris than Atlanta, I have to say, but most of the people, we travel on the ground while the freight on the surface enjoy the view. There is some, some, something that is not really good in that design. So we we'll try to fix that, okay, by putting the freight on the ground. Of course, it's going to be shared, so it's going to be interconnected, and it also raise a couple of fundamental questions. Is it possible to deliver a city through a different pipe? Through a single pipe, I would mean. We know that there are fluctuations among the day. We know that the distribution uh, in the space is not the same at every time in the day. Is it feasible to put everything in the same infrastructure without oversizing the infrastructure? That's a first tough question. But another question is, if we do that, is it possible to reduce the energy consumption? And the, the idea here, we tested in the thesis, the potential of energy reduction provided by such an infrastructure that is completely on rail and um, planned, so there is no traffic jam, or much less traffic jam than on the surface. And we are uh, pleased to say that, yes, we can save. Here you have energy losses. We can save a lot of energy, which means also if we save a lot of energy, we're going to save emissions and everything that goes with the energy uh, consumption. We did also a lot of things about resilience, but I think we're going to have uh, some uh, questions and discussions, so I will be happy to jump in. But uh, what I want to mention is that if you have the data, if you have the knowledge to another level, then you will change the system. And that's what happened also with, also with the digital internet. If you want to know more, of course, you go to Atlanta, that's sure, for sure. <laughs> but you can also go to Athens uh, in the next summer to attend the uh, physical internet uh, conference. Um, and it's going to be uh, near the Partium, a very nice venue. And it's uh, supported, of, of course, by Alice. We have a strong support from the European Commission on that. And there will be a plenty of activities, and PhD are more than welcome to join uh, this uh, conference. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Ballou, and perfect timing. You get a gold star. Um, with that, we'll open it up to um, the panel. Um, are there themes um, that you'd like to discuss with Eric uh, based on what you just heard? Uh, Frederick? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So I got, I got a first question. I'm, uh, I really uh, enjoyed the, the four-layer um, framework with the physical, digital, semantic, and services. Uh, I see two huge challenges, at least from my perspective, in this framework. Uh, the first one is, and I would like to know how did you deal with that and how did you manage to go through these challenges. The first one is really about the way you interpret the, the data from the digital layer to go to the semantic layers. I mean, this challenge of interpretation is, is a very tough one. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, let's say you are able to provide services at the, at the upper layer. How do, do you manage to implement it on the ground, uh, going directly straight forward to, 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 uh, to the physical layer? OK. So yes, two big questions. The first one, um, I didn't went to the details, but uh, we use the Think In plat platform. Think In platform from Orange. It's an experimental platform. It's a web of thing, a platform. So it's the thinking platform do, does most of the job that you are uh, asking uh, about, uh, which is how we start with different sensors, um, uh, connected objects from different technologies, how we manage the access rights and so on, and how we synchronize the digital twin to the real world, where do you have all the sensors and we manage the accesses and the rights um, and so on. So that's the job of Orange to make that happen, and, and it works. They don't do it just for logistics. They do it for buildings management, for all kinds of uh, applications. And then on, this, on top of that, we built the, and we designed the ontology. Yes, to uh, make the, this data a little bit more abstract and to provide the services and so on. And on top, we build here one application, but we can, you can imagine that uh, you can build different applications. But I can say that already Orange developed a software that is working on, that, on this architecture. So it's already implemented and live. So it's not just uh, something that you're going to find in the lab. But it's also, of course, it works at limited scale right now because we are limited for some data availability in Paris and so on. Not everything is open, but the arch architecture so far proved to be uh, robust. Yeah, <clears throat> on my side, I would want to come back to the the cargo project, the underground cargo project. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I would want to know wh what are the main lockers, uh, I mean in terms of tec technical lockers and infrastructure lockers, because probably there are a huge amount of investment behind and I want more. Uh, we have uh, a couple of strong barriers. The first one is uh, you need the political decision for that. Uh, so you need a political will to go further, especially in France, because we are talking about an investment in billions of euros or euros dollars is almost the same. So one of the first um, barrier is also um, the legal point of view, because you must ensure that there is still a fair competition between the players. So even if you have some kind of dedicated uh, infrastructure uh, with maybe one operator, because on the ground it could be messy to have uh, several operators, you should manage it in a way so you still have a fair competition between all the players, which is not that obvious. <laughs> and um, I mentioned investment, so the risk is also quite high. And one, uh, another barrier that I see is the fact that um, most of the side effects of logistics in cities um, are what we call in economy external costs which means they are not paid by those who <laughs> create them. Like if I uh, put my truck in the middle of the street and I block the streets, the others will lose time behind me, but <laughs> I, will not, I will never pay for that, okay, so far. 
Uh, I did the calculation. Paris, two billions per year. First, congestion. So even if we switch to electric vehicles, it will not disappear. Uh, the second is air pollution. I'm not talking about CO2. I'm talking about really all the, the particles and so on. So uh, it, it, it will mostly disappear with electrical vehicles, but the congestion for sure will remain. Accidents is also very strong. Noise will partially uh, disappear. And there is still, I think, a strong competition for space uh, in cities. Uh, if, you know, you, if you know Paris, uh, Paris is really, really dense. So uh, I think that such system, they have some kind of future when, I am not sure, they had future uh, in the past. Chicago had such uh, system, underground system, uh, in the mid uh, uh, 20th century, but for uh, um, the coal, so it, it was out. Uh, the postal uh, offices, they've got that as well. Uh, in Paris, in London, in Berlin, in, in many capitals uh, in the past, but with the development of the facts, the telecopy and everything like that, they disappear, but not because the concept was wrong, because the customer finished. Uh, but I think with the e-commerce we have, uh, and the supply of the city, we have new uh, market for that kind of infrastructure, but it's still a huge challenge and a, a big uh, check to, to sign. <laughs> Uh, you, following your presentation, uh, we think a lot of the, the concept revolves around standardization and standardized containers, uh, especially when it comes with the mutualization of the asset between some of the, the players in the, in the network. What are, uh, for you, the main challenges for uh, introducing such a standard standardization that could or could not fit the work in the use of several actors. Yeah, the, the introduction of a standard is something really tough, uh, especially in the logistic world where you have uh, so many players, uh, a long history, tradition, and so on. The maritime container you just mentioned in the beginning, it took more than a century to establish the right combination. Mm. And even in the US at that time, we all know the story of um, uh, the, 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 I forgot the name now, but uh, the inventor of the <laughs> of the maritime container. But there was also challenges in the U.S. competitors, and they end up with different solutions. And at what point they decided to create uh, a working group where they put all the solutions on the table, and the twist lock was already patented. But the um, the owner of the patent said, okay, we're gonna put it on the table, we're gonna change it, we're gonna open it to everyone, we're gonna change it so we can have all a fresh start. So I think that we should invent a couple of mechanisms uh, to find a way to uh, introduce a fair competition between all the players. It's not that easy for the big ones because they don't want to <laughs> jeopardize the, the, the capital they have and the market share they have, but uh, at some point, they are big, they will remain big uh, if they are good. But to say, okay, let's move one step further and try to figure out what would be the next start line benefiting from all the contributions from, the, from each of those and then moving forward. Because if they remain with different systems, maritime shipping wouldn't be like it is today. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, maybe um, in our uh, last uh, six or seven minutes or so in, in this uh, blitz round with Dr. Ballou, I'll open it up to any questions from the audience. And maybe going forward, uh, as we do this format um, for a few more speakers, um, as the panel's asking questions amongst themselves, if you have a question, if you could maybe go to the aisle and position yourself by the microphone, that'll be a signal to us. Um, so with that, looks like we have a gentleman racing off to the um, microphone to pose a question. Hello. Um, my name is Cyprien. I'm a student here um, in industrial engineering. Um, so you talked about uh, basically a pipeline um, servicing the whole, the whole city. Uh, that's going to be highly strategic. So I'm wondering, and you also talked about competition, I'm wondering if, politically speaking, you would consider the state being a major stakeholder in that sort of infrastructure, or would you leave that private? 
the state will, of course, set the rules. Uh, who should uh, build it? What will be the legal framework uh, to operate it? Is it uh, some kind of uh, public infrastructure or private but open infrastructure? That's then I'm a little bit out of my competence zone because I'm not in the, <laughs> in the law. Uh, but there is a, a legal debate about how it should sh be shaped to be really um, um, useful for everyone and, and there is still a, a, a fair competition. But one thing is that we should have um, maybe just one operator inside, but the state or the region or the city would be involved one way or another. There is, it could be by setting the rules, it could be also as an investor, as a partial owner, uh, holding a market shares of the infrastructure, that kind of things. So it's very important to understand that this is not to be a monopoly, okay? So not talking about communism or whatever, that the, everybody will play the same place with one player is gonna decide all the rules. So if you look your internet, okay, you can go Verizon, you can go at and there are a bunch of options uh, that will happen. I think that when we go like in a bigger environment, bigger urban environment, you may well have several physical internet style operators that will share resources, but you'll decide, okay, which which vehicle, which service you're gonna take, okay, as things going to evolve. Like if you go in China, for example, did work a lot in Shenzhen, and uh, basically the the best one or the no, the, the 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 one with the highest market share was Shunfen, okay, SF Express, and even then them they had less than ten percent of the logistics flow in the facility in the city so this is a, just them at less than 10 person they had like over a million parcels a day so there's plenty of room for many the the trouble is that what we want to avoid as a key example in your mind is you're you've, you're you're sitting on your balcony and then you see one truck two truck three trucks four truck and they're all deposit things and you look at those trucks and then less than 10 person full so this is complete waste. It happens all the time in every darn city. So we want to avoid this, but doing it smartly the way we can do now in 2022 to 2023 and beyond, okay, and leveraging. There's gonna be infrastructure, there's gonna be regulations that are needed, but there's still a lot we can do. I, I'm gonna say the last thing on Cargo Souterrain. When I started the physical internet, Cargo Souterrain was, was already planned. Okay, you can read on this, and it's in Switzerland, it's a marvelous project. It's a gigantic project. So when we started, we said, yes, we can change the big fundamental infrastructure. It's gonna take decades, but there are many things that we can do that are much easier than this to start the game. Yeah, but today, it is signed by the Swiss federal government. It is launched officially. Exactly. But it's launched from a development perspective. Yes. Now they have to make it happen. But now it's true, okay? Now in Switzerland, it's, it's decided, okay? They, they've got the green light to make this happen. They have about 100 companies that are part of this to, to yeah. <laughs> they are part of this to, to make it happen. So it's such a big thing, okay? And Hyperloop is, is, an, is a shareholder of that stuff. There are many companies. And maybe if we could uh, uh, address a question from Professor Dahan, Matthew. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, yes, my name is Matthew Dahan. I'm a, a, a assistant professor at ISYE. Um, no, I, I really like the notion of like uh, increased visibility from the data, and I was just wondering how you're currently estimating the value of that added visibility, especially from a decision perspective or how to tackle risks. So I thought. That Yes, I was wondering what are your thoughts on, on that front. Yes, thank you for your question. It's a, it's a missing link in my presentation. So uh, for sure, we, we are not economists, so we are not talking about the value of the data. But what we are working on is to find mechanism so the data could flow from one partner to another without um, disclosing anything confidential, and, but allowing the coordination between the players. So what we are working on is a set of mechanisms. So we are working on mechanism design, that kind of theories, reverse auction, combinatorial auctions, all, all that kind of things you may know. 
and to uh, plug on top of a physical hub that should be the web platform or the marketplace to enable the flow going from all the containers going from one leg to the next leg, from one step to the next step. And if you are interested, we have a game that we played already uh, in different places and conferences. Uh, we have a game so you can be in the situation of a carrier trying to fulfill your own truck. You see how hard it is. <laughs> and sometimes it's going to be half empty. <laughs> but uh, you do your best. It's still half empty. And then we introduce the mechanism, and we also help you to discover the new solutions. Because by yourself, even on a small board, you will not be able to find the best solution. It's too complex. The complexity is too high. You have to design your route. You have to face the uncertainty of the new orders and everything like that. That's and manage business. the price at the same time. Because if your price is too high, you're going to lose uh, <laughs> the next order. That sounds like a cool thesis. <laughs> it, 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 is, uh, it was a thesis. The thesis was successfully uh, <laughs> defended. And, but it's not enough. And we still need uh, research on that. Thank you. So more much. than welcome to join. Great. I think that's, uh, again, perfect timing on our, our, our timer here for uh, moving on to the next discussion from um, Professor Matthew Dehan to Professor Matthew Loras. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, also a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, the, the purpose of my talk actually is about uh, questioning the, the potential impact of using physical internet in other category of ecosystems, not the regular ones, in specific ecosystem like humanitarian uh, operations, like uh, circular economy, uh, or like developing countries uh, logistics uh, activities. Uh, what is the starting point of this um, of this uh, research? Actually, is uh, as we all know now, we are living in an uncertain world with a lot of risk, a lot of opportunities, almost everywhere. It's clearly a challenge for supply chain and, and logistics uh, systems. And basically, uh, physical internet is clearly um, a good candidate, actually, to help us to uh, evolve and to change the, the practices and the, the business processes uh, of uh, uh, current supply chain uh, management um, uh, systems. Um, this has been demonstrated uh, during the last decade by numerous studies, research studies, but also a lot of uh, field applications of physical internet in various sectors. But most of the time, this uh, has been developed in a commercial and or industrial uh, use cases. Um, most of the time it concerns only direct flows, I mean from raw material suppliers to final consumer, and most of the time it is about developed ecosystem, I mean developed countries mainly, and uh, big cities like we discussed just before. So we think that there is a kind of lack uh, to, uh, to, to study the, the potentialities of uh, PI for other categories of ecosystems. So like humanitarian, like rural environments, so uh, very, with a, a very few population, for instance. And, and we want to, to know if uh, for these ecosystems, uh, PI has uh, some uh, potential benefits, uh, particularly in the matter of sustainability and resiliency uh, capabilities. And if yes, how we can implement uh, physical internet in such a context. So that's the starting point of this research. So in the following of my presentation, I just want to highlight a few research work uh, uh, which are ongoing and that are trying to, to uh, answer at least a part of this uh, question. But the first one is about humanitarian uh, uh, logistics uh, operations, a project that we uh, do in collaboration with Gyrotech and the Inter International Federation of Red Cross. And we are uh, working on the on a different way, actually, to manage the response to a sudden onset disaster and a different approach of, uh, of uh, the organization of humanitarian uh, organization in the field. So the first thing we did is was to uh, define a set of recommendations in order to um, put into practice, actually, physical internet in this specific context. So we, we thought about uh, the how to um, 
transfer the, the, the physical internet prodding to this very specific situation, which are uh, uh, humanitarian operations. So basically, for one example is the fact that currently, most of the humanitarian organizations work with a very hierarchical uh, uh, supply and logistic network, and they do not uh, use uh, the possibility of having multi-directional uh, networks, uh, so to connect different regional warehouses, for instance, with uh, national warehouses and district warehouses and so on. So it's one example of what we define qualitatively, and then we move to uh, an assessment, a quantitative assessment through an experiment, experimental bench that we developed based on simulation and optimization models. And we particularly developed a use case uh, with the Indonesian Red Cross, uh, uh, mainly based on earthquake uh, and, uh, and the flood disasters. And so based on these specific cases, we demonstrated that using PI-oriented organization and processes can get a very interesting results. And typically in this example, we, we, we can speed the process of response up to 72% in this specific case, which is quite huge. We can much better cover the, the, the demand of beneficiaries, and we can reduce quite significantly the, the, the cost of the response. So it's not to, to make more benefit, but to have the possibility to make more response, more operation with the same amount of money. So that's the first example uh, on which we, we worked. The second example is about the transportation and logistics in, uh, for developing countries. So we do that with a um, uh, university in, in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And actually, we, we noticed that the, the, the features of logistics environment are, are quite different from what we know in developed countries. And uh, today, it's quite close to the, the, the last question, but today, uh, uh, the, 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 the the answer, the solution that is um, um, considered by, by politics is mainly to make a huge investment to change the infrastructures, to change the means that are su uh, supporting the, the, the logistics activities. We, we, we think a bit differently and we are trying to show that uh, by using differently the existing means, the existing resource, we can probably get much more uh, interesting results in, in, in terms of performance. So we define a set of uh, a potential uh, alternative uh, organization for transportation in such a country. One example is uh, today most of the companies in, the, in this, this kind of cities use their own fleet of vehicles, mainly motorbikes, to deliver the product, to deliver the goods. They also use their own uh, distribution center or fulfillment centers, very often just house uh, with some goods inside. And uh, um, typically in, in a city like Phnom Penh, there are a huge amount of tuk-tuk almost everywhere. And these tuk-tuk are mainly used for moving passengers from A to B and uh, are very underused in terms of capacity. So uh, it's quite hard means most of the time, but all these tuk-tuk are connected today. So we are able to locate them and in real time, we are able to know if they are available or not. And so we are trying to see if by using this um, available capacity, we can change the game uh, regarding the transportation of goods in a city like Nampo. So the, the work is ongoing, and we are uh, expecting uh, a result very soon <coughs> to, uh, to, uh, on this uh, specific case. A third example uh, is uh, the Ecotrain project, which is uh, just starting now. Ecotrain is a French project that um, <clears throat> expects to reuse, actually, a very old uh, railway infrastructure that can exist in rural environments, in countryside. The idea is to reuse this uh, infrastructure that exists uh, to put on it uh, electrical, autonomous uh, lights, um, uh, yeah, shuttles, okay, to, to move goods and, and, to, and to move passengers. Um, and the, 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 the point is, with this project, uh, it opens a, a, a great perspective to, to, um, to better connect, actually, rural environments with the rest uh, of, of, the, of the country and other uh, networks, of mainly transportation networks. And so we are trying, uh, we want to, 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 uh, to work on the, on the, yeah, on the implementation of physical internet uh, through this kind of, uh, of system in order to enhance the, 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 the performance of, uh, uh, of freight transportation in this specific uh, uh, area. So we are working on three different things, mainly the first one is to design and, and to 
to create actually the different organizational schemes that can uh, be imagined based on this uh, future ecotron system uh, and to asset them in order to be sure that when we will uh, be ready regarding the shuttle itself, we will also have the good organization uh, uh, to operate around. The second point is to work on a uh, planning and scheduling system uh, uh, associated to this kind of, uh, of uh, organization. It's very, dif very different from what we know, for instance, for, for classical train uh, system. So the, 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 there are a lot of different constraints. One of them is the fact that everything is uh, from solar power. So it means that we have to charge the batteries during the day. So it means that we have to stop the train during the day for charging the battery. We cannot use it. You know, there are many other ones. So we are working on this uh, aspect. And the third thing is about uh, the building a control tower based on digital twin approach in order to be able to um, monitor and to uh, make decision in real time for the train itself, but also for the <coughs> uh, upstream and downstream part and every connection that we will have uh, around the train because the, the main challenge won't be in the train itself, but will be uh, regarding the connections. Very last example, it's about circular economy uh, in supply chain. So here we are working with a, a startup company located in France called Transition One. The business of this company is to change, to transform actually old um, vehicles with uh, um, combustion engine into electrical cars. Okay, so this is the, the ambition of this uh, company. And uh, the needs for, for, for this kind of, be of, of, of uh, service okay, uh, will uh, probably uh, increase drastically in the following years. And um, we are working with them in order to, to design actually their, their, their supply chain. And it's a great opportunity because uh, we can design the supply chain from scratch. So it means that we have no constraints to, <laughs> to consider. We can, we, can, uh, we can imagine something very, very new in a, in a, in a very challenging market and, and with a, a huge perspective in matter of uh, uh, demand volumes. Okay? So that's what we are working on. And there are two uh, uh, important lockers here. The first one is about the demand, how we can estimate the future demand of this kind of system in, 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 in circular economy. And all the projects, all the, the, the implementation of uh, any supply chain uh, or logistics uh, decision support system start with the, this uh, question. And in the context of circular economy, it's quite different from, from the other ones. And second locker is about the supply chain design itself to, to think something very different from what we know. Uh, and this, is a, this will be the challenge actually of this uh, project, which is just starting. It's also in collaboration with Geodetic. That's it for me. Perfect, great, thank you very much. <laughs> Let me first turn to the panelists, and again, welcome toward the end. Uh, questions from the audience? Anyone from the panel have a question they'd like to start with? Thank you, Mathieu, for your presentation. I want to come back to the second topic that you presented with the, the shuttle. Uh, at some point, you show a picture of the shuttle and with some maybe vehicles or containers. Do you have already specific ideas of what would be the size or how that kind of uh, containers would fit with other transportation means, both in rural areas or in uh, cities? Yeah. Um, actually, we have no one idea. We have plenty of ideas for, for that, and uh, nothing is fixed. Well, the, the, the specification is we should be able to uh, stop in a, in a station and in 10 seconds to move out and move in the, the, the different goods. So that's the specification uh, or the requirements. Um, regarding the, 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 the containers, for instance, okay, everything is open at that, at that stage. Uh, we expect something connected. We expect something modular. We expect something um, that will fit with potential standards which are on, on, on coming uh, regarding Alice project in Europe, for instance. Um, but I think that, that the main issue won't be the container or the itself. It will be really the connection with the rest, uh, and particularly in a rural environment, when you arrive in a village, for instance, 
you have almost nothing uh, except uh, cars or, or vans or, or small trucks uh, to, to deliver for the last mile uh, point. And it will be the, 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 the most important challenge. And so in the consortium of this project, we have some companies who propose some uh, prototype, autonomous vehicle prototypes to, to deliver but in a very different uh, environment than what we know with, with big cities to, today, yeah. And I have a question on the same subject regarding the control tower aspect of the, this uh, shuttle. Uh, obviously, the, this project Ecotrain is included into a much bigger supply chain and a much bigger environment. And how do you imagine the control tower regarding to the uh, inflow and outflow you're going to have in this uh, in this uh, ecotrain is this uh, an open control tower included into a much bigger uh, control tower of other members or how do you imagine it um actually in a, uh, yeah our dream is an open <laughs> control tower i don't know if it will be possible or not but it probably yes actually for 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 at least for, for some connection. If we consider the connection with uh, the national uh, train systems, for instance, we, we are able to know uh, uh, in real time, actually, the higher of all time departure and so on. So we can make some, uh, some, some uh, yeah, you can make some decision based on this kind of information. Um, but there are other categories of challenge regarding the, the, the control tour. The first point is the fact that here we are considering a, a train shuttle that is running on an open environment. It means that it's when, when you consider train today, if you cross uh, a street, okay, cars stop and the train pass. Okay? It will be the opposite with this kind of system. Okay? If the train uh, arrives somewhere where there is a car, the train must stop. If there is a child, uh, children uh, playing uh, football for somewhere, the, the, the train must stop. So it means that it will be <clears throat> quite difficult to, to, to have a very precise idea about the arrival time, for instance, uh, regarding the, the, these kind of chatters. And the, the third aspect is the, what we need uh, such a control tower, the fact that we expect something that we can use on demand. Uh, it's, 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 we know that for, 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 for Uber services and this kind of stuff, but for, for we are discussing about a 10 ton uh, system on the rise, uh, on the right way, it's, it, it's, it's very different and uh, it includes uh, a lot of constraints to consider in the, in the system. Yeah, one, one short question. Does this project provide you with a way to challenge traditional supply chain, I mean, non-PI supply chain versus PI and say, I don't know, show that there is some strong, tangible benefit, for example, for the uh, humanitarian supply chain or versus the classical supply chain? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think, uh, for the moment, we are not here. For the moment, it's just to, 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 to we are just trying to, to come to, to convince and to make the demonstration that we, we can change the game without uh, um, having a huge amount of money to make uh, a huge uh, investments uh, almost everywhere. But if we consider, for instance, the humanitarian uh, world, it's very, very far from their current uh, culture and uh, and the current practices, okay? So even if they show that we can reduce uh, by 70% the, the, the time of response, it's not enough uh, for, for <laughs> accepting the change and to move forward. So we, we will need to, to, uh, yeah, to, 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 to continue in that direction and probably to, to think about uh, very practical uh, um, implementation aspect, kind of quick wins, that we will be able to, 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 to put into practice very easily in order now not to make the demonstration by uh, and through simulation models, but to make the demonstration directly in the field. That for me, that's the next step for this particular ecosystem. Uh, and it will be also true for, for the developing countries uh, application. We are working on, uh, in Cambodia with a company called Little Fashion. Little Fashion is a kind of local Amazon. They are, 
uh, they, they, they manage uh, different kind of uh, of uh, of goods uh, and uh, they have a huge growth uh, in terms of turnover uh, and uh, probably if we are able to to show through this example that we are uh, that we can save money that we can save carbon footprint that we can uh, be much more effective in the response etc probably uh, we will have some opportunities to extend If I, if I may uh, change, because we, you've presented something on circular economy related to electrification. So I think this is a very interesting case where demand is going to be there for a number of years, but not eternity. Because at one point, all the fuel-based cars will get old enough that there, there, there's no interest anymore. But there's, we cannot think like this, okay, click, we're gonna go from a, from fuel to electric and you're gonna have millions and millions of cars that are gonna be put to the to the garbage can. And so so I like very much this no this notion and but on a on like you mentioned you, you have to think the supply chain differently because in fact you don't want to build something that's gonna be hugely permanent and also it has a lot to do with the age of the of the fleets, and then the, the perceptions of the people in the countries as to should I switch to electrical, etc. And on the other side, it's going to be a big deal as how much it's going to cost. Okay, so because if it costs me too much, I'm just going to go and buy an electrical one and say get somebody else deal with this. So, so I think the challenge are usually there. But how do you see like the physical internet concepts? Okay, being able to be used to to make this happen um, well, I think there are the many many potential uh, connections regarding physical internet here uh, one of them is um, for this project we expect to have no uh, permanent uh, manufacturing plan for instance no permanent distribution centers or whatever we want something that we can pop up depending on the needs and depending on the evolution of the re uh, technical uh, uh, specification for, for the product and the associated service so um, it's interesting because we are working with a company uh, who is led by uh, someone who comes from uh, digital internet so he's very <laughs> in line with, with this kind of approach uh, but um, yeah, so that's for me one aspect. The, the other aspect is the fact that for this kind of business, we are really, really dependent of the world supply chain. Okay, I mean that we are discussing about electric batteries, and we know that it's very complex <laughs> uh, to 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 manage and to to, to organize and, and and to follow and to scale up also because they, this is one of the challenge. And if we manage this as we did in the past in, in the majority of the, the sectors, it won't work. It won't work for, for sure. So we need to, 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 to change the, the mindset and to, 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 to work it really differently with an approach uh, like the physical internet propose. That's my point. Do I have time for another one? Yeah, that'd yeah, okay. be fine. So, so uh, I like the example also of Cambodia in, in, in with the city uh, not too far from there. Okay, there's Bangladesh. Okay, that, that is there. And a few years back in in my course 6339, I had a team that worked with somebody from Bangladesh and dealt with uh, the the garment industry, the ready to wear garment industry, and we found out it's huge because for them, okay, it's like. A, huge percentage of their economic, okay, uh, the, when you look at the gross domestic product, this is hugely important. Okay, They have thousands of companies doing this. They have literally hundreds of thousands and millions of people every day that work in there. And then you've got everywhere, you've got boutiques here that sell and brands, etc. Their stuff is made there in, in Cambodia and other places. But this is archaic the way it's done, okay? Uh, the way the orders are given to the, the, the manufacturers, how they, how they get their people, the switch from contract to contract, the, how they flow the goods, the, the, the fabrics to how they source and how they get the fabrics to the, to the plant. And then how do you get the finished products through all those congested cities with not too much digitalization yet, et cetera, to there. So the, it's usually complex. And we had fun 
uh, with with the team uh, designing what it would be if we would begin to change this. It was primary, but I think that this kind of thing was was very refreshing because we have to to say physical internet has to work everywhere in the world. Okay, not just in top countries with the top the top everything, but in 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 developing countries. But even the developing countries have, have a lot of potential now. Like all the everybody you get in many countries like that, and everybody will have some kind of smartphone and all that. So there's much, much that we can do going with the basic concepts and growing for this. So I, I like very much that you guys are, are trying to work in, in the, the metro, metropolis over there. So I like your feedback as to the overall kind of a, how can this really be done? Well, I, think you want to yeah, but I, I think that we have different challenges. It, it pays in both ways, but we have different challenges here. Uh, in developed countries, we have a lot of resources, but stuck in silos. So the main problem is to have a real state uh, of the system and uh, convince the actors that it's going to be for the best of each of us to uh, not work together or collaborate because it's like a dream, but to find mechanism again to coordinate so it, it will be for their benefit. So it's what we try to provide with some by highlighting the potential. And while on the opposite in the, let's say, developing countries, uh, we have a use of resources that is already to the max because there is a lack of resources in their that kind of countries. Sometimes the truck load is 150% uh, <laughs> or 200% because when you have one, you use it to the, <laughs> to the end. But there, and they find plenty of mechanism to coordinate themselves even without the technology. But then on that side, the, I, I, from my perspective, the, the question is more on the infrastructure, investment, and development of uh, that kind of infrastructure to, to have the economies of scale they don't have. Because if you remain stuck with uh, small bikes, and which is, which is good, but if you remain stuck to that level, at some point, there will be some kind of uh, potential you will be never able to, to reach. And of course, when we are talking about logistics, there are big economies of scale. A train is way better than a truck, which is way better than a, tr than a light uh, duty vehicle, which is way better than, than smaller ones, drones, let's say. <laughs> and uh, so we have to find that kind of uh, mechanism to make it up. I agree. I, I just want to, to add that uh, I think w one potential mistake with this kind of ecosystem is to try to reproduce what we lived for for inter, uh, industrial and commercial supply chains during the last few decades and to move from uh, integrating maturity level to uh, something more integri uh, integrated collaborative and then hyperconnected. I think we can jump directly to the hyperconnected level. That's the, amb that the ambition of all these works. Uh, and this is what we, we try to, to support. Yeah. So so on the, on the notion of infrastructure and all that, okay, uh, when we look at the case in, in Bangladesh, it, it became keen a kid that there were many stakeholders. For example, you would have like all the big buyers okay, from the brand, etc. This is big money for them. Okay, they, they'll go and buy for hundreds of millions. Okay, there. So, but they don't understand that by playing a solo game and by not helping the Bangladesh industry getting better. They're forcing their costs to be higher, their lead times to be higher. There's a bunch of things that is detrimental to them. So if you can get them to understand that, that's good. Then the companies themselves, they're stuck with having trouble to keep their employees, okay, to train them, etc. But if you, if there would be ways that that like uh, you're overloaded, he's underloaded, he's overloaded, underloaded, etc. Now they have no real ways to, to know about it. And they, they, so then the companies themselves, if they just open their eyes, then if somebody is capable of making it happen, like the value of information, then suddenly they, they can be interested in going for it. The government, okay, so now it's kind of, they don't think those ways, okay? So, so basically they don't see that putting money in such places would be making a difference. But I think that it has to come from many, many settings. And I also think that beyond the big infrastructure, the small gesture and actions are very important. Great. In a few words, I, I, I see something that can help us. The price of energy. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, the higher the price of energy is, the, the less you want to waste. And uh, so I think, uh, of course, it's, it's, uh, many people suffer from that. 
but the price of energy is also an opportunity to make the right use of what we have. And I think we're out of time for this session. Thank you very much, Matthew. And next up is Frederick Benaben. Hello, everyone. So my name is Frederick Benaben. Uh, I will talk a little bit about decision making and uh, system management. So the, the, the topic is about what we call physics of decision and how we can use some physics paradigm, physics metaphor to work on decision making and on, on system management applied on, on supply chain. So what is, what is physics of decision? The root idea is that some of you are students, some of you are professionals. The idea is that personally or professionally you have targets. At least what you have one target at the horizon and yet you want to reach that target. And basically this idea of having that target at the horizon makes you uh, susceptible to catch opportunity, to try to avoid risks that are around you. And the idea is that these risks and opportunities around you can be considered as forces, like physical forces, that will push you forward, that might break you, that might deviate you from your target. And the idea is that if you have this performance objective at the horizon and that you are trying to reach that, uh, that, that location, then you have to understand how risks and opportunities might impact that trajectory. And ultimately, the idea is how can we benefit from these forces, from these risks and opportunities, in order to reach our target, in order to impact by our own decisions this, this trajectory. So that's basically the principle of physics of decisions. And what I'll show you in the next five or six minutes, I think teams went away, so I still I might have more time. So what I'll show you is two videos of prototypes of these principles that are implementing in virtual reality, the way you can use it and interact with these principles uh, to, to, to uh, drive your, uh, your system. So this one is, is, a, is a supply chain. So you can see at, on the bot, at, the, uh, at the back, you see the, 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 the hearse. The, the hearse globe. So here it's about the supply chain. You can see it's a global supply chain. We have one company A, that, which is in Atlanta, and uh, it's interacting with suppliers, client, customers, and it's building it's building electric skateboards. It's been developed, by the way, by Miguel, who is uh, who is here in the in the room. And so here you have these white lines. These white lines, on the one hand, represent time, but also the perfect performance. And you have this green line, and this green line is your current performance. And the idea is that the idea is, is to try to have this green line as much aligned with the white line as you can. And then you have this blue, orange, green flukes, flows that represents risks and opportunities. And everything that we will do is try to connect this opportunity and risk with the white line at some point, at some moment of time, and see how it impacts the green line. And see if it's a benefit, if it might, if we can combine some of them, what if this happened, what if that happened. And you can see also, it's a little bit fuzzy, but you can see we have a gray vortex around everything, that's the safe zone. While we stand, while we stay, our green line stay in that gray zone, then we're safe. So we'll talk about strike. Of course, I'm French, so I like to talk about strikes, but also hurricane. In this use case, we have a supplier that is in Florida, and you know that there might be some hurricane in Florida. And so in that case, we'll see what happens if this hurricane actually occurs. And you see that there is a strong deviation that brings even us out of the gray vortex. And so we try to move with some preliminary decisions like uh, having some more suppliers, like safety stocks or that kind of thing to see how we can combine these decisions to try to overcome that, that, uh, that risks. Something that I did not mention is also the shape of the flows also represent the probability of this, uh, this kind of, uh, of event. So this is big, basically the first version of this, of this prototype. And I will move to the next one. So this, 
this is the new version of the prototype. Here, instead of having one blue, gray, green line, you have several blue lines. Each of them represent one KPI. And after that, it's the same kind of principle. Around me, you have these yellow balls. These yellow balls represent risk. You have, it's the same use case, by the way. It's still the, 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 skate, the skateboard use case. You have the risk of strike. You have the opportunity of working with a new supplier. But here you have these orange uh, balls. These orange balls represent, it's not about football, by the way. It's just, it represents the, the triggers of that uh, event. So what can trigger this, this hurricane? Of course, it's just the weather. But working with a supplier can be due to a network opportunity or it can be, it can be due to a hurricane. And then in that case, you will try to find another, another supplier. And you also can see that triggers are connected to each other. If you trigger one, then it might trigger something else. So you can move forward in time and you can see that you have the trace that is behind, be, behind each uh, balls that represent the way the probability will evolve. You see that it can change. You see these yellow balls is coming closer to the white line. So it, might, it means that it's more, more probable. So, and again, we will try to select one of them, activate the trigger, and you'll see that by activating the trigger, then I will see the impact on each of my, of my KPIs. In that case, you see there is a big impact on one of my KPIs due to this event. And here what we applied, the, the mechanism that we use is just that we use each event as a potential that creates risks that are potentialities. And if this risk actually occurs, then we have an actuality, which are the consequences. And here you can see that we have this huge deviation on one of my KPI. I don't remember which one, is, which one it is, but we can, I could just touch it to know which one it is. And I'll try to find some other uh, opportunities to try to reduce this big vertical impact on my KPI. So I will try to trigger that one. A new supplier, and you see it's been reduced a little bit. It's, it's less high. I will try to trigger another one. And also by the calculation and by the computation of the consequences, I will also get this, uh, this consequence. It's even, again, lower. It's reduced against the impact. So that's basically what I wanted to show in this uh, seven or eight minutes, these two versions of the same uh, tool in, in, in the evolution of these tools, and we're still working on that. Thanks a lot for listening, and of course, if you have questions. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. I've always, always loved that, that demo and the application of it to the future. I think there's going to be limitless um, types of opportunities for, for collaborative strategic and tactical planning that, you know, be, be, and it's beyond just supply chain and logistics. Um, panelists, um, do you all have um, any questions that you'd like to ask? Yes, thank you for the presentation. I, I have one question because I think it's really interesting to have something interactive, but coming back to the physics, for me, it looks like we know the end point and we try somehow to minimize the energy to reach the destination. So it's, it would be some kind of a minimum cost transportation problem, something like that. Integ it integrates a lot of things with uncertainties and so on, but at the end, it's from a fundamental point of view, it looks like that. So I'm wondering uh, if you compare what you do with a tra more traditional operation research approach and that kind of thing, how you position that kind of work to the more, let's say, yes, OR uh, approaches. Yeah, thank you. So yes, we, we're, we're definitely in that family of work. The, 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 I wouldn't discuss about the performance because I think we are probably less efficient than strong operational research, the, 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 I know because I know the way we calculate it, so I know it's, it's less efficient, but the, 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 the domain where we are stronger and the, main, the domain where it's really interesting, it's the combination, the way we can combine events because, because actually we don't model the, the, the event as they are. We just create them as a physical force. So by doing this, we are better in, a, in, in the way we can combine them and, and, depend, and, and put them in different moments of time and say, what if it happens there, 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 and what if I do that at the same time, right before, right after, and I can do whatever I want in terms of combination of a lot of events to try to find the best path. Of course, what is also interesting is that 
once we have all these forces and their variation in time, what I can do is that I can run, and we're not doing that yet, but that's one of the plans, run some, uh, for example, some genetic algorithm that will try to suggest the, the, the best combination of events to, uh, to, to reach our target. But also we have events that we cannot control. So it's also what if happens, what this happened, how can we um, counter strike that, that, uh, that, that event? And the last thing is that something that is really interesting in this way, you, you mentioned energy. We are also working on the, because this space where it's evolving, it's the space, it's, it, it's the performance space and what is interesting is the space density. Let's take the students here. You have, your, for the moment you're here, you're trying to reach a career. You're trying to reach a position. You want to be that position, that position. I don't know. It's, it's at your reason. Something that is interesting is, is this reasonable to try to reach that, 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 that position? Or would it be far more easier to go that way than that way and get a position that is nice but you haven't seen yet? You haven't considered that because you, ha you had no reason to consider that because you thought that was the best option. But due to the space density, it's far more easier to go that way because you have a lot of risks, opportunities, I mean, potentiality that can drive you and steer you that way. So yeah, that's my answer. So uh, one, one of the places, I don't see this very much in, in direct competition with operation research, for example. To, to me, it's kind of complementary, but it can be used in places where it would be in competition. But I think the, the biggest, air, biggest area here is uh, with things like physical internet, we're gonna get more and more options. You're given with, uh, in, you're playing with ecosystems that are already existing, and there are a lot of the decision that we'll want to automate, okay? So there's not gonna be humans in the loop. But then when we have humans in the loop, then, then how are we gonna help them? So we're in the era where it's clear that most of the young people here, you're gonna, in, in the next 10, 20 years, you're gonna work in, more and more in the metaverse, okay? It's coming, it's coming big, okay? So the early phases, people will show you the equivalent of your real world in, in a 3D uh, level. We do this, we're gonna have demos this, this afternoon and this kind of stuff. But what, what, uh, what, what Frederick is bringing here, okay, through pods is, uh, okay, can we work in something that's different than just the normal space and work in something like here, what to use is here is like, we're gonna put yourself in the performance space, okay? You can have cost, time, okay, quality, uh, robustness, etc., and, and, and work from there. So, and, and the, this notion that those are the decisions that we will not let done by just mere algorithm. So now we need to help the persons in the midst of so many decisions to be able to, to see it and, and aggregate. I consider what we have now here, what is being shown as like infancy level, okay? It's like the early, early stages. Reminds me a bit when, when we were the first times that we began to talk about physical internet, okay? So people will say this is crazy, utopia, whatever, okay? It was fun to watch, but now it's very, very different setting. So I think that this is a, a, a good lineup, but still, it, it, so those who came here and had no idea, some, some will be asking what, it's, what is it doing here? But it's very important because on those investment, those strategic type of things where humans will have to take direction versus another, I think that's a good place. Maybe, uh, I don't know if you're completely agreeing or whatever, but that would be my Yeah, I, I strongly agree, so thanks a lot. One more comment is that, Benoit uh, started by talking about metaverse and, 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 and immersive technologies. One thing that is very important in this domain is that we already have some strong AI tools, but it's very hard to interact with that kind of tools. It's very hard to be the one who can, I mean, tune it, decide how, to, how you can use it and so on. It's, 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 it's quite difficult. VR, out of this project, out of this work, but, of this work, but, but still, it's, it, VR is a very interesting way. I mean, immersive technologies are a very interesting way to bring AI to the user and make it, make it easy and obvious to use. And do you think that the users, the decision makers, are ready for that now? 
Okay. What about acceptability of this kind of solution? Yeah, that, that's that's clearly a very strong point. For those of you who will come this afternoon to the demo, and for those of you who are familiar with with VR and and uh, augmented reality, for the moment it's quite crazy to work, to expect that decision makers will take a, a two pounds virtual headset in their office and will use the joystick and, and all of these things to try to decide and to use it. But Benoit said it's at its infancy. I, my position is that VR immersive technology are at the same point as computers in the 60s. It's powerful, it's mature, but it's not really, I mean, computers in the 60s were huge. That was the size of a room that was very powerful to make computation, but how can you use it? As soon as it went through, I mean, under the, under the, the, the desk, and you had Word and Excel, I mean, that kind, of, that kind of tools, then it became used by everyone professionally. As soon as you had the internet, it becomes used by everyone personally. And I think that as soon as the, the VR headset will be that size with one day autonomy, $1,000, something like that, and you will have that kind of tools, I think it's going to be usable, and as, at the mo uh, I guess that decision makers in the next X years, I don't know how, I don't know how much, will be able to, I mean, I will, I will have someone sitting next to me in the plane that instead of opening the computer will just wear his glasses and, stride, and, and start manipulating the data and the inside of, of his or her company. So they are not ready yet, but I'm sure they're going to be ready in, the, in a few years, and we'll have to be, we have to be ready in terms of software as well. So, go ahead. No, I just, like, give me 10 seconds, okay? Uh, so, we, we, had, uh, we had Frédéric present in front of the, supply, the, the Industrial Advisory Board of Supply Chain Logistics Institute. There we have many executives from big companies, okay, all over from Amazon, UPS, and, and many GE, and so on. And it was amazing that many, many of them were really, really interested in this kind of thing, okay? So they spent and talked, and they saw perspective, and, and they saw the, the graphical, the virtual, but they liked the concepts, okay? Because they're the ones stuck with the executive decisions and all that. They're in the mess that they have now. So it was very interesting that uh, as we were exploring avenues, okay, uh, this was perceived very highly from top guns, okay, in the, in the game. Okay, so that was interesting. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, co coming back to the uh, uh, optimization point of view, do you consider this kind of tool to be more like uh, a scenario de generation tool or more like uh, a decision making tool? It's, it's, so it's a very good question. First, I have to say the way we do that, the way we do that is we have two options. The first one is really about simulation. So we run thousands of simulation and then we use this data to train neural networks so that we have a system that will be fast to react. And then it's, I would say it's really or to, uh, oriented toward decision making. It just, but as, as it's based on what if, I, I would say, and sorry for the, for the way I will, I will answer your question, but I would say it's a scenario based decision making tool. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's the way we do it. Another way that we're doing that, it's more mathematic, it's just, it's, it's more about using differential equations and finding the right coefficient to try to model part of the system and part of this reaction in, in, in time. But at the, at the end of the day, what you are playing with is a scenario building tool that allows you to try to reach your uh, performance objective by Instance, by, uh, by triggering risks that you fear or opportunities that you want to seize. This is the Miguel I talk about. D. Miguel. Yeah, hi. So my name is Miguel. I, I participated partially in the project of the skateboards that uh, Fred was showing. And I think I just wanted to make a, a very quick comment about everything that everyone is mentioning because I think it's worth it. We've been talking about digital twins. We've been talking about complexity. And we've been talking about the, the how make managers be aware of all of these different integrated complexities that are not easy to see. Uh, an example of, of, of the game that Derek has had us played in some of the physical internet conferences in which you try to make your best decision, but you really can't. And the connection between OR and whatever we are seeing now of physical decisions, it's, it's, it's actually complementary as Professor Benoit was mentioning because what we have beneath it, it's optimization. 
We have mathematical models for the routing. We have simulations model for the testing and the scenarios. But actually, it's very hard from a control tower type of perspective to make decisions with all of this huge information that is embedded in these models, just watching our two or three KPIs, which is what happens in real life, right? A manager has to sit down in front of a spreadsheet and make a decision based on two or three things that he or her sees. But now this is, for me, it's a game changer because you can have all of this information embedded like in the, in the, in the back end, like, and the big manager doesn't need to know all the details of how the simulation works or how many experiments were run, but Trusting on all of these tools that are beneath, this, this manager can really like just boom, take a couple of good decisions and see how they will actually impact like the overall performance. And that's where I think like the, the POD would have like very powerful impact. Thanks, I'll hire you for, to create a company on this. <laughs> but uh, if, if I just make one word, the, if you go a little bit further, the decision maker could be not one executive, but a bunch of players all around the world competing. And we know that there is already a couple of applications uh, in, uh, in medicines uh, with some uh, diff space that are created to find the right mutation in genes and so on, which is really hard to find. And here, you can say the same. You have thousands of players. They, they're going to play, play. They're going to have some rewards. And at the end of the day, you have the best uh, or the best that was found. Uh, knowing what we know, uh, solutions um, coming from uh, that kind of uh, environment. Absolutely. And I would say also another thing. In, on one end, like the artificial intelligence and kind of automation of the decisions that we can make, of making all sorts of suggestions, we can have AI playing constantly, like all different, like hundreds and thousands of scenarios and trying to play with one another and just suggest it to the decision makers. But also you can have this competitive type of scenario in which you can have this uh, you've seen all of this, uh, uh, sorry that Louis is not here, but for Amazon, you know when they do this contest and they put out a problem out of a thousand researchers to go and play and try to find the same decision, we can have exactly what you are mentioning, Professor Eric, and, and having a thousand researchers trying to make a, a case that is actually going to be embedded in the supply chain later on when we like find the best decisions. So I do think there's like a lot of potential there. Yeah, thank you. OK, so I'll definitely hire you. I think we may need to move on to our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Johan, all set up. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan Levesque, and I'm uh, leading the research and development team of La Poste, that is the French equivalent of uh, USPS. And I will try to give you a brief overview of what are the, the physical internet initiatives that we are <coughs> running in La Poste. So, to give you some element of context, the origin of the physical internet initiative in La Poste revolves around, around the Olympics in pa Paris 2024, in which uh, the city of Paris decided that this is going to be the world first carbon neutral Olympics with everything that targets zero, zero emissions, including uh, parcel delivery that are the main uh, focus of La Poste. To give you uh, some element of context, the city of Paris is really hard to get into. You have here a snapshot of uh, the daily demand over Paris. And as you can see, it is a real mess. Uh, for uh, example, uh, a delivery operator in general has to stop every 20 to 30 meters in Paris. So this is a highly density populated city and a super high density of demand that we need to cover. So how does the historical parcel delivery network work in France? In general, you will have some big regional hubs that are fulfilling very urban hubs and that themselves were fulfilling, uh, were sending trucks into the cities with everything that comes with this, like huge line hole, huge traffic jam, and so on and so forth. So it was the historical massified, I would say, delivery network that's going to be harder and harder to, to manage as time goes by, because cities are closing themselves to this kind of uh, systems. So what we did recently was we switched our uh, delivery methods by introducing cargo bikes in the city centers of 
all the major big cities with introducing micro hubs in the city centers of these uh, cities, like micro surfaces that uh, welcomes cargo bikes from which and are fulfilled by trucks and from which uh, cargo bikes can uh, start and take loops around the city delivering parcels. This is an example of cargo bike, and this is an example of the workflow we are trying to, to tackle here. We are able now to sort the parcel by the night and deliver them uh, doing several loops with the use of this kind of cargo bikes. And obviously, what we can see is uh, there is a much, more, much uh, smaller physical capacity when we take a cargo bike regarding uh, a truck. But we are much more agile and we are take, uh, losing way less time than a truck in the traffic. So in, uh, in general, we consider that we have a, a gain of 40% of productivity using cargo bags in the city centers of big cities. And obviously, when a truck needed to leave uh, its depot for the whole day, now a cargo bike can be reloaded and it allows La Poste to have the rise of new service levels that we will get into afterwards. But to give you an example, this is how were short distances treated beforehand. This is the city of Paris here, and uh, this is a distance of more or less five kilometers. And as surprisingly as it can be, it was the way it was treated. The, the parcels went out of the city into a truck, into another truck, and at the end of the day, it took two days to make five kilometers. And obviously, there were cargo bikes at the beginning and cargo bikes at the end. But uh, this is obviously suboptimal when it comes to new service levels like day plus one delivery, day, uh, same day delivery, or even H plus six deliveries. So we are trying to rethink our uh, delivery methods in order to optimize this kind of flow and in order to tackle new service levels and higher service levels. Uh, sorry. In order to reach this kind of thing, the, by introducing sorting, micro sorting capacities into micro hubs and by mutualizing the the resources with other operators. That allows us to do same D deliveries, H plus 12 deliveries, H, H plus six, and so on. We now use smartly our cargo bikes and we use the, their ability to do loops and to reload themselves in order to be much faster. So it started in 2019 where we were only uh, covering one city, one city of Paris, and with only 100k parcels per year, into six cities in 2020, 31 cities in 2021, and now we are more than 55 cities covered, covering more than uh, 40 million parcels per year. So we are really massifying these kind of approaches, and we are uh, uh, pushing towards the physical internet. But of course. This is not sufficient. We've just introduced a new, a, new, uh, a new vehicle, and we need to think on how can we use it at best in order to provide the best service levels and to, to, uh, reduce, the, to reduce the, the emissions of CO2 and to uh, be the cheapest as possible, as cheap as possible. That's why we are now working on autonomous vehicles in order to replace or to play the role of mobile micro hubs in city centers of major cities and between regional hubs too. And with this kind of uh, uh, autonomous vehicle, we are also introducing the fact that we are standardizing the containers because we have the ambition of using this kind of, uh, this kind of autonomous vehicle to re automatically reload the cargo bikes by plugging containers directly into the cargo bikes, as you can see on this picture. And with this kind of dynamic reloading, we are reaching even higher service levels and we are able to mutualize our activities. We, 
with a lot of different companies that could inject flow inside our net delivery network. So you can see here the, the type of uh, autonomous vehicles that are already in use uh, and the type of uh, container we are trying to, trying to use here. For example, the, the top right one is in use in the city of Montpellier in France and the, the bottom one that's a picture here but is in use, will be in use in Paris in the next few months. And uh, the top left one is in use in, uh, in Montpellier too. So I think it is over for me. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Perfect. Well, thanks very much. Uh, panelists, questions for Dr. Johan? Um, I, I was wondering, actually, if your model, part, uh, your, what you suggested as an evolution, particularly for transportation for the last mile delivery for city center, if we can use this approach in other kind of city, because uh, Paris is a very specific city with specific uh, features, I mean in terms of density, you mentioned that before, uh, in terms of surface and so on. So can we use exactly the same approach almost everywhere or we have to adapt? Obviously we can do it on a smaller scale of obviously uh, i was taking paris as an example but we are trying we are considering it in every city in france as we are deploying our delivery network in more than 55 cities now uh, obviously paris is uh, quite a, an exception in in france because it's the more dense it has the biggest density it has the the biggest demand and so on and so forth but the other major cities i would say even outside france uh, it, the, all the major cities are still need to be covered and still ha have we still have a lot of difficulty to get into this, these kind of city centers. So uh, at a smaller scale, obviously we are going to develop it uh, in all the cities in France. Thank you, Ponce. I think it's a really good example of the trade-off between uh, the vehicles, the demand, and the, the transportation network, how you adjust, and you are in a dynamic environment. So as soon as you are more demand, then you can have another level uh, in the network. But uh, in the past, it was designed as, as a hierarchical uh, network, where you have to go back to the backbone and then to come back. Of course, the classic uh, point would be that, OK, it could happen for a couple of parcels that's nearby, but then we have so much savings by doing it in the big, <laughs> uh, with the big hubs and so on, that at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's worth it, even if we have some troubles uh, on, on the marginal troubles. What, we, what, what you display, and I think is really interesting, is that you have something that is much more ad hoc or meshed network, which is really fundamental for me. And also, um, the, the point is that, uh, so it's really good. Then you mentioned that as a provider, you still have limited uh, loads. So you're maybe with the others, you could have better uh, or heavier vehicles, so more efficient vehicles, because when we are talking about supply chain or transportation, it is good to have very good, very small vehicles only at the end, really at the end. So it means that just before we should have enough volume to have, um, so, sorry? More yes, more density and, and, and so on. But it's, it's really interesting uh, to see that. And it's really interesting to see the evolution in the future with the evolution of the demand and the vehicles. And uh, maybe it wasn't clear in my presentation, but we are, we are trying to focus on uh, uh, creating some kind of a control tower, as you were mentioning uh, beforehand, uh, by introducing uh, Internet of Things into all our, of our vehicles. And uh, this way we are able to, to manage our flow at each level of the grid. So we are having uh, cargo bags at the end of the, uh, I would, wouldn't say the, yeah, at the end of the, the, grid, the, the, the bottom level, and we have autonomous vehicle, we have small trucks, big trucks, and so on and so forth, and they can all be interconnected. So we are trying really to, to break the tree shape 
of the historical network by uh, introducing this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, just a parenthesis, okay? Uh, the first time he, uh, Joanne presented this uh, with Walid, okay, he showed me the data and said, I don't understand, okay? I mean, they were showing they were going out all, all around the city, etc. I said, how in the world are going to be able to deliver in four hours within the city, okay, or uh, two hours, etc.? So I just started to laugh because the, La Poste was, the, which is the French USPS, by the way, okay? So they, they would not conceive that they could deliver within two or four hours. But just before that, he, had, he was telling me, bragging almost, that he could, with his bike, cross Paris in an, one hour? Yeah, one hour. In one hour on his bike, he crosses Paris. Okay? And then he tells me that if I want to ship something from one part of Paris to the other part of Paris, okay, it would take minimum 24 hours. I say, Whoa, okay, which world are we in, okay? It, did I wake up into a different world, et cetera? But, but it was real, but, but they're really tackling it now, and now they're really t aiming to be much more. They, they're breaking it, you've seen it, so this is very impressive. So I want to say the anecdote, because I think it, it, it really did happen, remember? Okay, I was, exactly. I was I don't know, a flatter bastard, could we say that on this? Uh, but the, anyway, it, it, I couldn't believe it at the beginning. But now the, we, they're, they're going, growing very much. One thing that in, in your presentation that I want to, to question, okay, because you're talking autonomous vehicle, okay, and autonomous vehicle for me, except the ones that go very slow, okay, so right now this means that you have to have autonomous or dedicated lanes or roads or system okay for it to be otherwise it's so dangerous okay when you get to trucks later on it's going to be become better but i i'm because you seem to mention it as something that you do or are about to do but i'd like to understand where you're going to use those autonomous vehicles the thing is uh, we are facing a double challenge here the first one is uh, obviously the technological one because we need to introduce this kind of uh, autonomous vehicles and i would say we are trying to introduce them in three segments of our supply chain first one is the highway segment and it's pretty straightforward. This is a big straight line. Nothing much to say about it. The second one is in our own sorting facilities. Well, in, within the facilities by uh, interacting with people, basically. And the third one and the most challenging one is uh, the urban logistics uh, part. I would say the speed is not really important here since you are not this is not what you are targeting when you it comes to urban logistics uh, at least in europe and uh this is not the main issue here the main issue would be the uh, acceptability social acceptability of these kind of solutions and the way we are uh, managing them into an, an optimized network i would say so uh the first action we are trying to take is uh switching from a, a from a level three autonomous vehicle to a level four autonomous vehicle without safety driver. Uh, this is one of our, our main challenge. Obviously, we are not gonna put fully autonomous vehicle tomorrow on the road, and uh, we are gonna go step by step by uh, uh, firstly having a, a driver inside the auton autonomous vehicle and having dedicated path, I, I wouldn't even say lane, but a dedicated path for this kind of uh, vehicle, and then as much as the technology becomes more mature, we are going to extend the, the, the possibilities. Uh, thank you. So I understand the benefit of the micro sorting that you presented, and I think it's 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 great benefit. Uh, I would like to ask you a question about some PhD work that I've seen a few years ago. I think Mathieu was the director of this PhD. It was about the hitch hiking a parcel. And um, the parcel that knows where it should go and that is trying to jump into the right transportation system to try to reach that destination. Would it be of complementarity or would it be of benefit for what you presented here? Is it an avenue that you would like to, to explore? Uh, it's a question of granularity, I would say, because uh, uh, we are... Uh, 
managing a lot, a, a big flow of parcels, and I'm not sure we want to get into the granularity of a single parcel, and we want to create batches of parcel. So uh, if we have each hiking ba batch of parcel, obviously this is the kind of thing we are trying to, to get into. Uh, we are not focusing on the single parcel, single parcel path right now, but uh, maybe this is something we will try to handle in the future. Maybe a very short question there. On one side, you have the big volumes with long distance, but cheap because of the of scales. Mm -hmm. On the other side, you have your more direct uh, connection, but with much lower volumes. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, is it cheaper? In fact, this is not the same flow because... Yeah, yeah but if you send through the classic organization, in the, before you uh, came up with your innovation, it, it was done going out, sorting, even go to another sorter and then come back. It is obviously cheaper. It, but this is not what we are trying to target right now because we are trying to uh, extend our uh, market shares into speed deliveries and uh, actually the, the flow that would remain in within the city is some market share we weren't uh, managing beforehand. So, yeah, if we send a, a regular parcel into a day plus three delivery, it will be cheaper to 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 use the older to use the older one. But uh, the thing is, it looks uh, horrendous in this kind of thing. But it is in, uh, in the in the historical network. But it is included into a massified network, not just holding a single city, but several ones, and. Uh, the tree shape remains the efficient, I would say, for uh, massifying the flows. Yeah. Let me let me add one detail on this. Okay, I think that the the smarter you become within the city to leverage and build the infrastructure that is upper connected, then suddenly you become attractive. For, for many other companies that could leverage that power. While if you stay more classical, long lead times, et cetera, they're gonna try to find other startups or others that say, let's get the dinosaurs live their little life. Okay, we're gonna go at the speed of today. But if you are transforming it so that you can get at, at that velocity at, at good price, okay, then suddenly that's what's happening with USPS right now, okay? Amazon brings it near the city and USPS is delivering, okay? And they do it with many companies, not just Amazon. So now what seems to be a small little hub, okay, is not anymore that much a small one because it's now come, uh, shared by several. So that facility that if I do it alone, it's tiny like this. But now if I have 20 companies that are leveraging my, my logistic services, then that hub may be three, four big, times bigger because I'm gonna be putting more hubs and be more hyperconnected. You get the logic? Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, 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 we are pushing towards the mutualization of resources and mutualization of everything in order to see the, the logistics and parcel logistics most, more as a logistic as a service. Uh, and not as a standalone network doing things by itself. Yeah. And I think um, we need to, to go forward. We did want to provide opportunities from the audience. Um, Miguel, if you have a succinct question, um, you want to yeah. ask it? A very short one. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Well, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I just have, I'm very happy to see this because it's very similar to the research we had in the Express with the mesh hyperconnected network, and I'm happy to see that it's actually happening. Uh, I just have like, one comment and one question, very quick question, and it's related to what Fred was mentioning. Who and how is the sorting process happening in the micro hub? Like, because of course I want, I want to move something through the micro hub like, network instead of going to the sorting center, like someone has to like figure out where to place it in the micro hub, right? Is yeah. it the couriers that are uh, th this is a good question, and we are really challenged on, on, on this. Uh, the thing is, this is a, a, a human dedicated position that is sorting the parcels uh, in the micro hub, but that is also preparing the, the parcels that are coming from outside the cities. This is a, a human position from now, and we are trying to put more intelligence in it by uh, uh, 
automating, uh, putting uh, uh, robots, basically doing it, micro robots or micro sorting uh, capacities. Uh, we are working with a lot of uh, startups right now that are helping us in this kind of process. But for now, this is a human uh, sorting the parcels. Yeah, I, I was thinking about the automated vehicle. If you have enough automated vehicle moving the cars, there's going to be like someone that has to somehow sort o it. Obviously, and it comes back to the, the, the concept of uh, standardization. W when you have a standardized uh, container, you can plug it into uh, an automatic uh, sorting facility or sorting, sorting uh, robot, I would say. When nothing is standardized, you have to handle the parcels with your hand. So for now, this is how it's going. Okay, thanks. And uh, I think we have one more question as Benoit setting up. Yeah, I have a very quick question from a non-expert. And, and by the way, thank you for these uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, comments and presentations. So some of the big cities like Paris have a lot of uh, underground uh, distributed infrastructure like the, the metro. So uh, can you comment why this is not being considered to basically help with the deployment and access of... Uh, uh, for now, this is an accessibility reason. Uh, you cannot go into the, the, the subway easily uh, with this kind of vehicles. Uh, we were considering once using drones inside the metro uh, network by the night when there are no, no uh, 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 trains. But uh, this is more an accessibility uh, reason. Uh, we are considering using parkings and parking lots uh, uh, underground in order to dynamically reload our, our uh, vehicles. But uh, so far, we are still doing everything uh, at daylight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the subway in Paris is already saturated. So there is no empty slots for anyone uh, during the day and during the night, because during the night there is the maintenance. So it's, uh, it's so it, maybe it's for another network. Uh, by the way, uh, he's told about me for at least 78 years, okay, that Paris was considering using the subway. There's been <laughs> a lot of studies, okay, uh, and conclusions are sad, but that currently that, that's the way. But I do believe though that in many cities that are less saturated, leveraging the underground subways, okay, uh, could be very, very interesting. But Paris is, uh, yeah, it's too saturated. The underground as it is, yeah. underground, but yeah. Exactly. yeah, I get it, okay, good. So I've got the pleasure to be the last presenter. So in the, I, I'm very surprised because I, I thought that I would have a very more squeezed time to do, but I, I was organizing everything, so I said, let me put myself to the end. Uh, so let me uh, rapidly show you a, a few projects that we've been doing and, and are doing uh, uh, relative to physical internet. So. We've worked in recent years with uh, several major companies in the logistics domain in, in North America. We did it also in China, but here I'm more showing more results from North America. I cannot name the companies, but I can tell you that they're very well known, very well known uh, names uh, in, in America. And basically what we had as a project is they provided us tons of data, okay, on all their operations, their demand, all across the network, across the United States, okay. We're talking literally thousands of facilities okay, that we were using and many millions of parcels, okay, that, that had to be moved through, through, the, through the system. And uh, we modeled their, their extensive operations as they do it now, okay. It took us a year and a half to work with them and I'd say more than 80% of the time was, was taught to pass that at modeling their system because it's so complex and things are not working perfectly. So you had to attach the pieces and make it work uh, so that it's quite representative of what they achieved. We succeeded and then the rest was much easier to do which was the physical internet way to do it. And then we run extensive simulations okay, as to how to do this but embedding all kind of decision protocols calls, okay, how we would do it. So we embedded like going to modular containers, okay, like which have been mentioned several years, and doing this consolidation according to distance in instead of moving a single parcel or just set of parcels where 
putting them in a container that is going to go in a given direction, do the work on this. We work on building mesh network, multi-tier uh, mesh network. You see in red, this is the, the network to traverse North America, okay? And, and then when you get into a region, then you're gonna get much more like the red type thing, and then you've got the blue, which is much more local type, type of network. Uh, we leverage, in the red the links, for example, those are segments, so we would add shuttles going there and, and computing all, all the costs, the delays, the imp imp what's happening, the OBS, et cetera, and work with on-demand transportation. When we run all this and, and they change checked us every, we had meetings with them every week. They checked every single piece of our results over and over again, okay? So I'm not giving you the exact results, that's confidential, but I give you like orders of magnitude. So from a service perspective, we got faster, more punctual delivery, and almost no lateness uh, was gotten. Operational cost okay, has been reduced by 50%. 40% in handling and 60% in, in, in transportation. On the operations, on managing this, okay, was gotten much, much, much more simple and at the same time more flexible because they are relying, they were relying on extensive optimized plans. Okay, the big routing models that you, that you learn in, in classes, okay, they were using this and it's huge models that are very, very common. Some, and the problem is that they finally, when they make them available for operations, things are not the way they had planned because those were done on, on numbers that were estimated, so it never really works, so they have to patch a bunch of things. So we simplified a lot the way they were dealing with. Uh, much greener operations, reducing CO2 emissions by over 60%, and we succeeded to have parcels that now we would go on, on trucks, but we succeeded to get them on time using rail, which is much more, uh, much greener. And also we succeeded to things, uh, par things parcels that they moved through air, okay? And now we would, we would get them out of the air and get them in time and say, uh, really. We got more than 80% of the drivers to sleep home every day, okay? And, uh, removing all the sleeper routes, okay, that, that they have. Okay, almost all of them. And we also open avenues for faster delivery options for ground parcels uh, while uh, incurring very minimal uh, additional cost. Now, it was fun because like for a little time, okay, we didn't hear about them. They, they said, yeah, this is very good, etc. Then they, they clammed, okay, and we didn't hear anything. And then, whoop, okay, uh, then, then we learned that, whoa, okay, in the last three, four years, okay, they've now work at improving way much okay, their, their networks, their operations, exactly the lines that we're talking about, and now their network begins to look a lot like this, okay, in there. So it was very fun, and now they're returning, and then they want to do next generation, etc. cetera. So, so that gives you something very practical. Now, another practical project that, that we have, that, was, that one was uh, COVID-induced, okay? So, you see, it's about delivering cars and SUVs, etc., so that have been made in plants, okay, and now have to be delivered to thousands of dealerships across the, the, the United States, and uh, you can put between five and, and, and nine cars, okay, uh, on a truck. And the problem that they had is that in COVID, you, most of the people, okay, decided that they would buy much more online which meant that all the e-commerce players had much more deliveries to do. And their deliveries that they had to do were requiring a lot of truckers in regions. So they would say, would get, give you the same price, salary, the same dollars that you have right now, but you're gonna sleep home every day. So those companies, okay, were losing drivers and truckers, okay, by the tons, okay? They had somebody that we worked with, they had were lost 30% of their drivers in the last quarter, okay? So this is typical, okay? And so in, in overall, in the industry, they, they have turnover of more than 100% on drivers a, every year. So the challenge was, can we get those vehicles from the plants, and the plants are, are, are mostly uh, between, like in the southeast and climbing to Detroit. Okay, that's where most of the plants are. And then, but you've got, okay, demand everywhere. So how do we make it so that we can deliver this, okay, but uh, with, uh, with getting the, client, the, 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 the people, the drivers home every night, 
and also making sure that we're going to be on time and not expanding too much in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse gas and energy and, and, and transportation and needs for, for trucks. So that was our challenge, okay, given by one of the major companies that was dealing like more than a million uh, trucks, okay, a year, okay, uh, not trucks but vehicles to deliver. So basically we went at studying the data, there are many students here, PhD students that have been part of this project, thanks to all, uh, to, we made this happen. So, but we began to, to draw what would be the network of hubs to be able to make this happen, okay? We developed all the, uh, the algorithms to pilot that every day, okay? When, okay, here's what we have to deliver to each place every day, etc. Are we gonna make this? Where are the trucks, etc.? There is uncertainty on the routes. How do we profit from such a network? We develop all the simulations, okay, to be able to see what it does based on data that we have from, from, from the company. We developed all that we did experiments showing how this would work and get it ready to to be used essentially uh, from a prototype perspective. Okay. Oh, sorry, uh, there. So that that's what we end, ended up doing. Now, from from an operational perspective, okay, the company uh, we they like the principle, they like very much, but they were completely tight, okay, and, and they could not make it in time for the COVID situation that they had. So they just had to patch it otherwise. But it was really, really much appreciated. And we learned that the carriers, okay, not the OEMs that are producing the cars, but the carriers, the ones that, uh, that have the fleets of trucks, okay, and et cetera, are the ones that are in the middle of it, okay, that, that really we, 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 want to, we want to be working with, et cetera. So now what we're doing, okay, having talked with several companies, we're expanding this where now we're taking the full set of manufacturers across North America with all the used cars, also Carvana, Vroom, et cetera, everything that comes from the ports, that comes from train, from Mexico, et cetera, from Canada, and we're looking at all the flows and now we're gonna, we're hyper-connecting this and making it happen. This is now ongoing research that we're having. So very good lessons that we learned, okay, and also very good promise to, to, for implementation in, in for comment year in, in large scale here. Now, a very interesting side, okay, most of the people that work in physical internet, they talk about transportation. I showed you a couple of examples here, but it's way beyond uh, just transportation. It's all the deployment of products, okay, all the inventory, the fulfillment, et cetera, distribution, but it's also production, okay? And now, in, in fact, it has the potential to transform industries. We're giving you an example where this is what we work on with, a, with one of our ma major partners. So we are in the construction industry and trying to move from constructing buildings on site toward producing pr building modules in factories Getting those those building those those modules, okay, like you think half an apartment, okay, the cube, the toilets in me is put in there, okay, the everything's painted, the floor is there, everything is there, and they just have to bring it to the site, crane it, okay, attach it, connect, okay, and it's ready to use. Okay? So that's the spirit that is happening. Now the logic is we want to do this at grand scale. So all across the US and to help solve things like the affordable housing problem that is it. So to be able to construct like tens of thousands of housing units okay, in, in a given area okay, to solve the housing problem. Also in hospitality, there's so many hotels that have like some chains have 500 hotels that they're waiting to, to, to build and not, don't have it yet. And there are many other contexts like this. So how can we do this? And also how can we have, there's a need for a health center because there's a COVID or whatever name it's gonna be that happens. We need an hospital to be there rapidly. How do we make those things happen? So we're developing the new concepts where all the facilities are taught to be mobile. They're going to be adaptable. That when we have demand popping up, okay, with contracts, we will set up rapid plants, okay, in the cities, okay, and basically uh, feed them by kitting centers. We're going to get the parts fed by by relationship with the suppliers, and this do this very very dynamically from something that starts as a concept and get there. But the, the company we're dealing with, they are not even to operate the plant. 
It's going to deal with the general contractors and all those people around that are coming from the cities. So it's a complete physical internet types of setting with the major platform that is making it happen, working with software. We're helping them designing the factories, designing the kitting centers, designing the supply chain and logistics, hyper-connected way, designing all the software okay, to, uh, to make this happen. We're not making it, they, they are working on this. How do we plan those projects, etc.? And uh, also making sure that from a greenhouse guys and mission and all the environment, we're gonna be a uh, good life. So that is an uh, ongoing project, very much fun. And my last slide is, is just that uh, we, we started a new net zero freight system uh, program okay, uh, at Georgia Tech. Okay, so we had big donation and this is launching. And uh, we have developed our framework to deal with it. And the, the core things okay, that are at stakes okay, are in the middle in blue and those are ways of what we're gonna do. But I want to emphasize that yes, people spend a lot of time on electrification, clean fuel migration, et cetera. They're very important, okay? We're gonna deal with this, hydrogen, solar, whatever it is, okay? So, but essentially there's at the top, okay, you have freight demand reduction, transport mode optimization, asset utilization optimization. And those, okay, the way we tackle this is physical internet way. So the type of concept to make sure that kind of things have been discussed, okay, are core to this on a grand scale, okay, trying to transform the overall freight system in, in, in countries like the US and North America and events right across the world. So this is starting, okay, uh, we already have a lot of activity, okay, in, in, in uh, initiatives that are popping up uh, around this. So thank you very much, I welcome any questions. I have one. Um, co coming to your uh, maybe first project, but uh, you uh, shared some impressive uh, improvements. But I'm sure you, when you dig in, what are the uh, main levers contributing to the uh, improvements? So it's yes, wh 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 where it's coming from. <laughs> this is good. So the question is, where, where are the levers coming up? So the, those huge gains, how do we get them, okay? So th th there are many things that are happening at the same time, okay? So first, when you look at their vehicles, okay? So when we have the real numbers, okay, and we see what they're there, we see that their vehicles, I mean, they're not loaded, okay? So not at all the way people would be thinking, okay? And then they have, a, they have routes, okay? They have those long routes because they want to maximize what they've been taught in class, okay? Would be get the maximum vehicle routing, et cetera. But that creates a lot of complexity, okay? And, and things like, uh, things are not there because that route, I mean, every segment, you've got uncertainty. Is this crowded, et cetera? There are all kinds of things happening. And, and in fact, they don't get in time, so they don't synchronize, okay? So all this stuff hurts them hugely. So at the end of it, okay, we end up, okay, that we are filling the trucks much better, okay? The fact that we do not try we don't even try to get a big route, okay? What we're doing is between you and you, okay? So those are two ups. How many days are we gonna have, okay? And we just, have, we just make sure that it's gonna come at a given time and we just contract with the, with, with the transporter so that this is gonna be guaranteed here. So we simplify, we decouple, etc. So we use all the key principles. There's no magic to it, okay? It's just doing at grand scale, okay? And really learn, knowing the, doing, I mean, what happened, okay? I'm gonna joke a little bit, okay? But they opened the kimono, okay? So instead of seeing just the exterior, okay? We saw everything, okay? And when you begin to see everything, okay? <laughs> you find out that it's not as nice as they claim all the time, okay? And so we use physical internet principle to just make it better, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I would want to, to come back to the, the production example, the, the, the example about building production you, you mentioned here. Uh, I agree on the fact that we 
we should do much more on the production perspective for physical internet uh, than we, we did in the past. My question is, uh, actually I was wondering if we can apply this kind of approach for any kind of production system, any kind of sector, because here for building components, it's quite not easy, but it, it's quite simple to see how we can implement physical internet paradigm. Can we do the same thing for food industry? Can we do the same thing for pharmaceutical industry, for instance? So that, that's an excellent question. Is why, why am I showing at this stage, okay, solutions that are related to the automotive industry, then the modern construction industry, etc. It's because uh, I've been at this game, okay, since 2006, okay, so in, in getting there. So I've, I've met all kinds of things. Okay, Eric, in many ways, I've faced the same things in early on. And, and what you, we've done a lot of studies that will show the big potential, okay, on, on many things. But, but now we need to get this done, okay, get this there. So if we try to go too wide at the beginning, it just, I mean, it's too much to absorb for, some, for many people. Like, you had a slide, okay, with the, with the container. Germany is proud because they have one modular container, okay? All our studies show that if you have a single size, okay, there's a lot of time you're gonna not be able to do it or you're gonna over or under utilize all kinds of things. But they have to start somewhere, okay? So they're proud and they should be proud because they started, okay, get something. It's multiple companies, yes, and they succeed to make it happen. Okay, so that is, for me, a big deal, okay? So it's the same here. So why pick those ones? Honestly, because I need got people that have needs that are in trouble, that at the same time people that have vision, that have the drive to make it happen. And one thing that I'm looking is at this stage is are there ecosystems where we can have big impacts, okay, in there? And those two are, are two. And, and, and I'd say automotive, that's, there's another issue to it, okay? Because when I started physical internet type of things, people told me, okay, if there's one place you don't want to touch, but well, okay, it's the automotive industry. Don't even think of going there, okay? So if you tell me this, it's kind of okay. When am I gonna do it? Okay, so and that's happening now, okay, in there. Uh, while the other one was much more like a, an opportunity that came in, but we matched this on both sides and said, yeah, there's a real good fit and get there. Now, to answer your, your true question now, it's, uh, I think it can be used in many places. I will not claim you can use it everything in every industry or that I think you can but I don't think you'll have that much impact okay so there are places where where it's in, intensive in supply chain interactions and in logistics interactions etc so I think now you've got more potential other places if the price that they charge a client is under dollar and the product just costs five dollars and the end link costs two dollars and the rest is all marketing and all these kind of stuff or or big R&D okay then you're minor league, okay, here. But if you basically are a place where this is significant, then there's, then there's a lot of potential. So every time that you've got something that is fragmented, that you see that uh, you've got full truckload and companies have to wait forever, so you see that they're dismantled, they're disrupted, they, they're not working nicely, so those are good, good target. So I'd say that most I can, we can use it, but there are, other, there are places where they're much more ready and, and susceptible to, to appreciate it faster. The other ones will come in, but later in the game. You've, uh, I mean, Alice, as the European initiative for physical internet has been mentioned uh, several times. I have, uh, and I don't know about the crowd, but I don't have a clear vision about the um, world cartography of uh, PI and how it's distributed around. I mean, I, of course, the Barry Center is here at Georgia Tech, but what about the, the rest of the world? I mean, you have Eric in Paris. You have, what's the, the initiative in other continents, in other co countries, academically, professionally? What's the, what's the status now? Okay, that's a big question. Okay, so, <laughs> but, uh, but let, let me try, and, and Eric, I think, can, can complement on this, okay? So the three continents where we see it the most, okay, are uh, America, Europe, and Asia. Asia, Oceania, Australia is coming, it's, it's starting, but those are the three places where we see it. The, 
the logic at each place is very different, okay? Uh, Europe has been by far the most advanced in terms of overall strategy, overall kind of a commitment to a roadmap, okay? And, and getting major projects publicly funded, okay, project, but even companies get money to do physical internet projects, okay, in there. So there's been a lot of this, okay, going on, and several of the people here are, are actors in such projects, okay, but the, we've done a project, one of our first big one was a Procter & Gamble was part of the project, okay, Modulushka, so in there. So it was, it was really fun, okay, we did great stuff. So, but Europe has, has been leading on that side quite a lot, okay? Uh, in the U.S., it's the inverse. The government is not there, okay? It, it may come, okay? But there's so many things happening in the U.S. that getting that battle done is... Uh, I, I don't like politics enough to p spend my time lobbying and all that, so I, I, we didn't go these kinds of ways. But the companies, though, are really, really smart, okay? A few years back, okay, we had a small company that had a, a couple of people that came to the International Physical Internet Conference, okay? And they began to roam, to talk with people, they attended things, etc. And that company is a little bit too well known, okay? It's called Amazon, okay? So, and, uh, what happened two years later, okay, several of their facilities and their operations began to look more like physical internet, okay? Now, they're not yet there completely, but they're advancing very, very strongly, okay? So, so that is an example. I'm dealing Shopify. Shopify, everybody that is, deals with e-commerce a little bit knows Shopify. Now they get into fulfillment. I talk with the key people over there. They're starting this, and their core vision is physical internet, okay? I'm talking with another company in the, in the, the major company in the uh, apparel type of industry, okay? And they're doing something grand scale, okay, that is, that is starting, okay? Physical internet. So you've got tech companies stored here in, the, in, the, in Atlanta, okay? I remember they came into our, my office when I came in Georgia Tech, began to talk about this idea about stored, etc. I said, guys, go for it. But they were too small. I couldn't do big research with them or whatever. So they took the ideas and came. They are now a unicorn. Okay, they're worth more than a billion dollar. Okay, they were in my office in 2016. This is uh, there's not perfect physical internet, but there's a middle. So we see a lot of these kind of things happening, okay, uh, in North America. Asia is a different kind of game, okay, because it's highly competitive. The market is so aggressive that they, they grab all the initiatives, and it's a mixture of the government on one side, the huge big art entrepreneur on the other side with with so much market okay that it's it moves fast there so but it's like it's like it's it's in the middle okay between like europe and in the us in terms of logic and it's going there so we'll see what happens okay the the late comer okay uh, that has surprised everybody okay me included okay uh, was japan okay they, they began to talk with us, they had delegation, they came to, to here, to Georgia Tech, they went to Paris, okay, to see this, and began to discuss with us and begin memorandum of understanding, etc. And now Japan, okay, as it's not just, the, in Europe, they have, the, they have the roadmap. The roadmap comes from Alice. Okay, which is kind of a, a technology arm of the European Commission. Okay, well over there it's a Japanese government that says we're, by 2040 we're going to be physical internet. Okay, you get it. So, so big difference. So they have the industry, etc. So they now have the Jap Japan Physical Internet Center. Okay, so it's not like just one university. It's it's Japan. Okay, in there. Okay, so they're moving, okay, and they, they, those guys know how to drive, and they're very, very serious, okay, to, to transform this. And then we see popping up at many places, okay, in Europe, France, okay, uh, Austria, Netherlands, okay, uh, Spain to some degree have been like the major player. Germany has gotten the game a bit later, okay, but those are the, the kind of places. Have I missed something, Ben? I mean, just has one thing. Um, about physical internet, if you think about what the difference between just subcontracting, the, one of the big differences is the standardization uh, that make it uh, seamless and uh, more or less integrated, uh, but without integration. Uh, 
in uh, what we see at international level right now is a strong push from China to do some standardization of all uh, logistics processes. And I think here we have something to be uh, quite uh, cautious because uh, we, there won't be several standards at the same time. It's not standards anymore. But uh, China is pushing really, for, uh, really strong at ISO level, which I think is good. Uh, it's good to have standardization in, in, in logistics. But uh, at some point, uh, the, I would say the Europeans and also the North Americans should be uh, really involved in that process. Otherwise, uh, we may miss an opportunity. Uh, so it's something that uh, we should have uh, in mind. Otherwise, we're going <laughs> to be uh, maybe uh, we have competitive uh, or competitors of systems and, and things like that. One thing on that line, okay, that may help because this is a threat, okay, this is important for the world, okay, but at the same time during COVID, there was a bunch of industry people, entrepreneurs and industry people uh, in, in China that were stuck in their house and uh, many of them, over a hundred of them, began to exchange posts, okay, uh, on physical internet and, and getting their impression, what it's all about, where it could be, etc. And now they're publishing a book, okay, on physical internet that is driven by industry. And now they, they are interacting with the government to try to push it even more and make it happen. Where it's going to go, we don't know. Okay? You cannot predict these kind of things, but at least it's, it's, an, it's a little bit of light okay, that could, could make a big difference. And I think we want to get everybody out by, um, say, 12.15, so maybe that leaves us nine minutes um, for maybe a combination of, of questions and any final comments from the panelists. Uh, first, any burning questions from the audience? So I was uh, questioning a bit the um, the role and like the um, the pertinence of uh, Alice, because all the organizations that were to install some kind of uh, physical internet, uh, some kind of IoT organizations, were non-concurrential. For example, like the Japanese state, uh, even like the uh, Chinese association of uh, of uh, companies that are like driven by uh, the Chinese state. But in the case of Ellis, uh, in fact, the, the European countries are in a rough concurrence. And we can see that with the war on Ukraine, etc., every country is trying to kind of get the most profit out of it, uh, even without uh, the other European countries. So is it something really like pertinent to trust in Ellis to uh, bring the IoT in all countries? Or should we more like develop something that is more country-based? Alice is a European technology platform. Which, what are the, who are the members? Members are companies, big companies, DHL, Procter & Gamble, Kinney Nagel, and, and others. So um, those, these companies are not only playing at the level of one country. If you talk to uh, the role of Procter & Gamble in Alice, Procter & Gamble is not interested by Belgium. They are based uh, in, in, in Belgium. <laughs> but uh, for the, for the R&D in Europe, they are not interested by that. So they think across borders. And on the other side, uh, if you think about the European Commission, the European Commission, they set really challenging goals about the environment. It was still just reduce emissions, not interested. But now it's, it's implemented in the regulations. Scope free. Uh, you should compute all your carbon footprint. You're gonna be um, uh, you're gonna be charged very soon on that, uh, based on the price of the carbon and everything like that. So on one side, you have the big companies working together to try to define what is the best for them. And honestly, right now we are trying things. It's experimental. All the projects are experimental. Modulushka project uh, that was done uh, almost 10 years ago was completely experimental. But now we have boxes in operations in Germany. And of course, when you look at the L'Oréal, Procter & Gable, Enkel, and the others, they are not interested about Germany. <laughs> Germany is the inception point. So is it the best approach? I can say. <laughs> Uh, but I think that it's good that at least we think at uh, continental level. You know, uh, 
So that's, that's something quite positive, and uh, companies are really in that game. I will just give a compliment, a complimentary example, because I think what you mentioned is right. Given, given the nature of Europe, I believe that Alice has quite a place and is playing a great game, okay? So remove Alice and, and a lot of things would never have happened, okay? So, so that I give them a lot of credit, okay? At the same time, okay, like for example, you go in Austria, okay? And, and basically they're doing PI projects within Austria. Okay, and, and that's great, okay? So it's not because it's Europe, and at least doesn't have like the monopoly on things. It should be happening at all kinds of levels, and I like what they're trying to do uh, uh, in Austria. So, and there are other places, but I'm just giving that one because I, I, know, I know a bit more. But uh, that's fine, there, there are several layers, but there are layers where you have to think uh, complete, uh, complete Europe level. Like for example, if you, I think you know more Europe, but uh, you understand the 10T, ne 10T trade ne networks, okay? So, so it it shows how across the Europe, okay? How it, the what? Yeah, that's it. How, how the trades are going, how the flows are going, okay? But in fact, okay, they show you see the intersection here. You think that it's going to be easy to change. They never thought about this. What they were talking about is the cement, okay? It's the road itself, etc. They don't think the logistics. But now what Alice will bring is say, no, no, you cannot just think this. You have to think, okay, in physical internet way and think hubs and things how you're gonna consolidate and all that in an open way. And I think that's where having Europe level is making happen. And the other point that Eric mentioned, which is very important, most of the companies that are serious in Europe never work in a single company, in single country, okay? They work in many countries. And a lot of the transport that is being done, oftentimes will start uh, many truckers from Poland, okay, that will transport stuff all across Europe. So we have to, it's, it's large scale. And now with China, you have the link all the way to, to China, but now with Russia trouble in Ukraine, that's, that's a bit trouble, but still, okay, they, they want to connect, okay, all across, all the way to Beijing, okay, so in, in Shanghai, etc. So, so you, you have to think continental at one point, okay? Excellent question, by the way. Any uh, final comments by panelists or burning questions? So we'll, we'll adjourn. Thank you all for joining. Um, um, we'll have lunch. Um, I think uh, you, you have ordered uh, different things, so you'll find, find your category of food. And then at 1.30 um, at 765 First Drive, um, either the first floor or the fourth floor, depending on where you want to, to start. Thank you. <laughs>